you, Brother Sam and praise team. Thank you, Michelle, for that beautiful song. Jesus said in his scripture, his house shall be a prayer for the nations. It didn't say it'd be a house of preaching. It didn't say it'd be a house of singing. Those are important things, and Scripture talks about them, but actually Scripture says, Jesus says, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations and all ethnic groups. Billy Graham, someone asked him, he says, what is the key for a successful revival? And Billy said, well, the key to anything successful is three keys. He said, prayer, prayer, and prayer. Remember when we looked at encourage one another, someone asked Truett Cathy what, the de- you know, what is the definition of encouragement, and he says, encouragement, is who needs encouragement? And he says, anybody that is what? Breathing needs encouragement. The ear today, you're breathing. Anybody that's breathing today needs prayer. Today I want to talk to you about prayer in this series on one another. Summer, we've been looking at how we're to serve one another, and we're members of one another, to love one another, how we're to show honor to one another, how we're to live in harmony with one another, how we're to encourage one another. Last week, we looked at how we're to forgive one another, spirit-led forgiveness. Today, I want to talk to you about pray for one another and entitle this message, Touching a Hurting World. Touching a hurting world. Now this word one another, just to remind you, is found 100 times in 94 New Testament verses. About 50 of them are commands. 60% of them come from the Apostle Paul. But today we're going to go to old camel knees. Say, who's that? That's James, the half-brother of Jesus. His nickname was Old Camel Knees. You want to know why? If you can't figure it out, I'll tell you. Because dude was on his knees praying a lot. And he knew how to touch a hurting world. So let's go to James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. And let's read this text. It says, Is anyone among you suffering or in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him and anointing him all in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray. For one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again. The sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Now it's amazing in These verses, 13 through 18, you find the word pray or prayer or prayed seven times. And today we're going to see the importance of prayer because where it says pray for one another, it's a command. It's a command for you and I to live out every day and it's in the middle voice which means, hey, it's something that you must do on your behalf. You must pray. Today what I want to talk to you about today is this. Christ followers are commanded to pray for one another. Scripture says that. We're to pray for one another. See, God's people in the Bible are referred to many times in the Bible as people who call on the name of the Lord. If you read Scripture, you've got Moses and David and the disciples and Paul and many others in Scripture. They called on the name of the Lord. And you see that in Scripture. But the question that we have to ask ourselves today in this self-centered world that we live in is do you care enough to pray for one another? Will you take the time to be concerned to pray 
for one another. See, we can touch a hurting world when we pray for one another. And so today I want to give you seven keys. Yes, seven. Since pray is found seven times here, I want to give you seven keys about prayer today and how we can pray for one another and touch a hurting world. Number one, we're to pray during times of hardship. Is anyone among you suffering and in trouble? It says what? He should pray. This word here for suffering means the evil blows from the, you suffer from the evil blows of the outside world. James is talking about, are you under pressure today? Are you under stress today? It could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual. And that suffering is taking away your joy and happiness. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call on me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. 1 Peter 3.12 says, Because the eyes of the Lord on the righteous, his ears are open to their prayer. See, the most important thing you can do today is pray. It should not be our last response. It should be our first response. See, when you got times of hardship, trials, and pressure, and suffering, you ought to pray. When your brothers and sisters in Christ got suffering and hardship and trials and stress, you ought to be praying for them. See, when you run across people in the world that are hurting and broken, you need to pray for them. You ought to care enough to want to pray for them. So how do I do that? Let me give you an example how to do that. Say you got a neighbor, you got a friend, it don't matter. Workmate, you have a little just general conversation, how's it going? Well, man, it's not really going good, man. You know, my, I've been sick, my wife's been sick. Kids have been sick. Man, it's just not been going well. Say, hey, anything I can do for you? They might say, no. Well, can I pray for you? Sure, I need prayer. Simple as this. Say, I'm in the workplace. Simple as this. You don't even close your eyes. You just pray for them. Say, hey, dear Heavenly Father, whatever their name is, Lord, may your healing be on him and his family, may you bless them, and God, may you show them how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't even have to close your eyes. You could do that at school, you could do that at work, you could do that at Walmart, you could do that anywhere. Pray for them. You don't have to get on your knees and come on, you know, and pray 48 different thousand words in some King James English. Just touch somebody because they're hurting and be caring enough to pray for them. So you can do that for your brother and sister in Christ too. You just see them in the hall and say, hey, I know you're hurting. Can I just say a word of prayer with you for just a minute? You don't have to drop down and have a three-hour prayer meeting. Show them that you love them, that you care about them, and that you'll be willing to pray for them during a time of hardship. See, we're to pray during times of hardship, just not personally, but when other people are having hardships. Second, we're to pray during times of celebration. Is anyone cheerful among you? It says, sing praises. It's talking about the well-being of your soul, that you've got joy in your soul. See, a Christ follower is not filled with happiness from the world, what's going on outside the world. Man, we're filled with joy what's going on the inside. Because of what God's doing, we're walking and talking with God. See, I believe praise should be a part of your prayer time. Really, you ought to open up with praise. Thank God you got another day. He's blessed you to have some breath in your lungs and that he loves you and cares enough about you and he's been doing some things in your life. You ought to want to praise him. See, that's prayer. If you don't know, read the book in the middle of the Bible. It's called Psalm. 
You'll see it a lot of times. David, he's praying, and man, he's pouring out your heart, but many times, man, he's praising the Lord. See, we ought to be doing the same thing. See, many times when things start going well, and there's celebration going on, we like putting it on cruise control and we quit praying. Don't stop praying because things are going well. Because I promise you, there might be something just around the corner and if you don't keep praying, it's going to slap you upside the head and you ain't going to be ready for it. And when your brother and sister in Christ, maybe it's not going well for you, but it's going well for them, you need to rejoice with them. Say, praise the Lord. Man, I'm, man that's awesome what you're doing in their life. And say, like, Lord, why are you doing that in their life? You ain't doing that in my life. We're to pray when it's going well. Steve Gaines, who's pastor at Bellevue Baptist, he's actually the president of our Southern Baptist Convention, said this, prayerlessness is the worst form of pride there is. See, when we don't pray, it's like, Lord, I don't need you. I don't care whether you got hardship or celebration. When we don't pray, we're saying, Lord, we don't need you. So let's keep praying when it's good. Let's keep praying when it's not going so good. This is what he's saying. And let's be praying for our brothers and sisters where, whether it's going good or bad. But the third key is this. We're to ask others to pray for us. You've got to ask. He says, is any among, anyone among you sick? He should what? Call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him. Now this word here in verse 14 for sick means to be without strength, to be weak. That could be weakness in your body. It could be weakness in your soul. It could be weakness in your spirit. It's just not physical sickness, man. You could just... You could have just come through a time and man, it's just been a Job time and you're just spiritually weak. What does it say? To ask others to pray. Now what's amazing is here in verse 15, it uses the word sick, but it's not the same Greek word. Here it means, hey, if you're weary from life, you're weary just from the struggles and trials of life, maybe you're depressed, you're discouraged, you're defeated, you're just wounded from the world, you're strung out, you feel defeated today. He says what? Don't miss the important part. You're to ask people to pray for you. He says what? Call the, the elders, call the pastors, call the, the church leaders, call those godly people to come and pray over you. He didn't say call 1-800-FAITH-HEALER. He didn't say go to some healing service. He said call for your leaders in your church to come and pray over you. Now let me just say this. You have to ask. Your leaders just don't read your mind. If you want prayer, you got to ask for it. Simple. It's what the text said, right? The one that is sick takes the initiative to ask. Say, hey, would you come pray for me? Because God just doesn't send it to the leaders telepathically, hey, doo -doo 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 -doo, and go to that person. Because you need to understand, this is just not physically sick here. It's spiritually and emotionally. And if you need prayer, you need to ask. And if you don't ask, you've got a form of pride in your life which leads to prayerlessness. Say, will I be healed instantaneously? I don't know. This text is not a text that where the elders come and they do this and all of a sudden you're going to be healed. That's God's job. God's the one that does it. But see, you need to understand, you got people all around you and you through the valley of 
uh, valleys in life, you need to ask those people. That's why you need to be in a life group, your Sunday school class. Why you got a small group of people around you that you're getting to know, and what do you need to ask? I need prayer this week. I got this coming up in my life, and I know this is coming up. Would you pray for me? Would you call on the name of the Lord to pray? And you know, when we start doing that, you know what will happen? Then you come the next week and say, hey, so-and-so, how did it go this week? Man, thank you all for praying. God just worked it out. It was awesome. So that's why you need to ask prayer because one, you're going to see God work in your life, but then your brothers and sisters, man, they're going to be encouraged because, wow, I was able to be part of that. I prayed and God answered. Ooh. That's why we need to pray. But you got to ask. we got a hurting world out there. I'll give you an illustration. Happened this week, church. This lady just came in off the road, walked in, Stephen met her. She says, I, I just need prayer today. She was in from Douglas, just driving through, stopped at our church. Shares her story, wounded, broken, hurting, was a Christ follower, but broken. We're able to pray over her. Watched her go out to her car. She just... You got people like that all around you, folks. I'll tell you the rest of the story. Never seen this happen. Told Wednesday night this, I'll tell you all this. Because this ought to encourage you. She went out to her car. came back to the door, knocked on the door, handed us an envelope. She says, when I'm, when I'm at church and I was here at church today, I give my tithe. Now, this lady didn't have a lot of money due to some things that had happened in her life. But you need to understand there are people hurt all around you. And many times you and I pass them by. Sometimes they're in our own church family. Number four, we're to pray in the powerful name of Jesus. The name above all names. John 16, 4, let me read you. He says, until now you have asked nothing for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. See, prayer is powerful. The power is appropriated through the believing prayer of a Christ follower. Prayer can bring down the resources of heaven like you've never believed on your problem and on your situation. But you've got to be willing to pray. You've got to be willing to give up your pride and say, all right, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray in the only name that I know how to pray in, which is the powerful name of Jesus. And so you've got to pray for one another, but it only comes through the name of Jesus. Number five. We must approach God with humility when we pray. He says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. To be honest with you, those are two present imperatives. So you want me to come to church every week and confess my sins? If you had revival in your heart, you may need to confess your sin. You say, where do we confess sins in our church? I'll tell you probably the best place to confess sins in church. Because sometimes you're like, I ain't going to do that in front of a church. Now, if God tells you to, and you, you, you've been deep in sin, you may need to. But really, the best place to confess sin is in a D group because it's a closed group that you're being accountable with, and you've got three or four men or three or four or five women, and you're doing life together, and you might say, hey, I've just struggled this week. I gave in to this. Would you pray for me? You know what those people... Those brothers or sisters are going to pray for you. But it says pray for one another. This word here, prayer, is a humble, begging petition. This is not someone saying, God, you're going to do this. Actually, it's a picture of a man 
that's got his knees bowed. He's on his knees. He's got his head bowed. He's got a dirty cap in his head. And he's like, Lord, I just come to you, Lord. I don't know what to do. I need you because if you don't come through at this time, I'm toast. See, prayer is not, God, you got to do this in the name of Jesus. So you won't put that tag on it there. It's not. We got to come to God and say, God, we need you to work. See, it's just the prayer of a righteous person. You might think, well, that leaves me out. Not. If you're a Christ follower here today, you've given your life to Christ. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can pray. You say, well, it, this is Elijah talking about praying. It didn't rain for three and a half years. What did the text say? It says he's what a human being like you and me, right? What did Elijah do? Yes, on Mount Carmel, he saw prayed down fire. But then some floozy woman said he was going to have him killed and he ran and fled and went and had a pity party under a juniper tree. So what are you saying? I think we could all, that means it covers us all. We can pray. And he wants us to pray. Yet, as Samuel Chadwick said, one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. The devil don't want you to hear this lesson. He's trying to distract you from anything and everything this morning. And if you allow him to, that's your fault. He's going to try to distract you anytime. I'm telling you, man, it's, it's warfare. You say, well, it's not hard for me. Well, then you need to start teaching. How many of you got ready to pray and then all of a sudden you start thinking about everything else in the world, everything else you got to do, and you're like, whoa, this is not what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be praying. You know what you need to do there? Just kind of keep a pad or your smartphone, and when you get distracted, just say, hey, Siri, remind me, go do this, and then go back to prayer. See, prayer is powerful. And prayer is not powerful due to long prayers or high-sounding words in prayer either. Say, so what do you mean? Peter, when he was walking out on the water, and he's walking toward his Lord, and then all of a sudden the wind and the waves came up, and he started drowning because he got his eyes off of Jesus, he didn't start praying some long prayer, did he? He basically prayed three words. Lord, save me. He just got straight to the point. He didn't say, Lord, this, due to all this water, and stuff, he just, Lord, save me. See, we got to approach humbly and pray, Lord, we need you, Lord. We got to pray for one another through the good times, the bad times. You got to ask for prayer. But then number six, we must pray passionately, specifically, and persistently. It says here in the text, Elijah prayed earnestly. Are you passionate about prayer? Are you passionate about spending time with Jesus? Are you passionate about praying for others? Some translations say the fervent prayer of a righteous man or the urgent request of a righteous person is powerful. See, when you're passionate in prayer, God can accomplish much because your prayer life will be energized by the Holy Spirit. See, prayers that get results in the Bible were not long, drawn-out prayers, but they were pointed and powerful and to the point with passion. And then, we need to pray specific. What did Elijah pray? He didn't go into very detail. He just prayed it would not rain. And it did not rain. Right? It did not rain for three and a half years. But he was persistent in the prayers. Because then it says he prayed again and it did what? Then it rained. 
And so we need to understand, we just have to keep praying passionately, specifically. Be specific in your prayers. Lord, just don't, just bless them, Lord. I hope you don't pray that for your kids. Be specific. Lord, I need you to work in their life here. Watch over them. Protect them. Deliver them. Help them here. Be specific. Keep them from the evil one. Help them to make good choices. Help them to make wise decisions. Help them to choose godly friends. And say, Lord, just bless them. The Lord's going to say, well, what does that mean? And then the Lord says, well, you must not be too concerned to pray for him because you don't want to spend any time with him. Jonathan Edwards said this, there is no way that Christians in a private capacity can do so much to promote the work of God and advance the kingdom of Christ as by prayer. Every great revival has been started by prayer. Not by some man-made program. Not by some man-made show. It's where people get desperate for God and start praying passionately, specifically, and persistently. God, we need you to show up. See, that's the problem in our churches today. That's the problem in our country today. We're not to a point of desperation. See, what does our cities, our states, our country in this world need? It needs some people of God to start calling on the name of Jesus that He would move and work. That is our only hope. It ain't the White House. It ain't some politician. It's God's people getting desperate enough, tired enough, sick enough, seeing all the stuff going on in our churches and in our world to be desperate enough to want to pray and take this thing serious and say, pray God, you have to do it. We've been trying to do it. And you know what can happen? When you start taking prayer serious, He can move mountains. And that's the problem. You and I don't take it serious enough. Number seven. We're to pray for one another. Because, and I want to give you two reasons very quickly. Let me give you this quote very quickly. Charles Trumbull said this, Prayer is releasing the energies of God. For prayer is asking God to do what we cannot do. We cannot save our friends, our family, our cities, our nations. We can't do it. So what do we have to do? Pray. That God would move and that God would use us. God would use us to care for others, to pray for us, and through that we would reach people with the gospel. So why do we need to pray for one another? Let me just give you, and this is not rocket science here, okay, folks? None of this is. Number one, you, just, you may, this might be for one of you today. The Lord hears our prayers. Now I know sometimes you're like, I don't know if I can get past the ceiling there. You know what I'm saying? but he does hear our prayers. You don't know why I think God's blessing here? I'm just going to tell you. Because we have people that pray. We have people praying during the service. We have people praying on Wednesday night. We have people praying throughout the whole week. That's why God's moving and working and doing a few things is because people are praying. And the Lord hears prayers. See, the most important thing you can do is prayer. Prayer should not be the last response, which a lot of times it is. It should be our first response. And then second, the Lord answers our prayers. If we pray in accordance to his will. As 1 John 5, 14 says. Let me just give you some examples of the power of prayer in Scripture. Joshua prayed. If you don't believe me, go to John 10. I mean, Joshua 10, 12 through 13. The sun stood still. Elijah prayed, and the widow's sons came back to life. Elisha prayed, and the Shunammite sons came back to life. The Jerusalem church prayed after Peter was in prison. In Acts 12, if you don't know this story, go read it if you don't believe me. He had 16 
prisoner, uh, 16 soldiers watching Peter around the clock. And the text states that the church got together and they were sending up a steady, the word means literally, a steady stream of prayer to God for Peter. See, you need to understand the New Testament church had no influence over the Roman government. They had no influence over the temple. They had no influence over all the Jew Jewish religious leaders. They had no money. You know what they had? One another in prayer. That's all they had. And they prayed. They called on the name of God to intervene. And you know what happened? God intervened. No, believe me, angel God just walked Peter right out of that prison. See, what happened is, is they were desperate. He was like, Lord, it's you or bust. And literally the church prayed him right out of prison. See, they prayed, God answered, God was glorified. See, God can do that if we will pray. These are seven keys. If we'll think about them, we can touch people, we can touch one another in a hurting world. See, prayer is what is just simple intercessory prayer. So what is that? That's where you have one hand on God and you have one hand on that person and you pray for them and you actually become a conduit of prayer between that person and the Lord. See, so that's what the Lord has called us to do, to pray for one another. Let me give you two stories that I heard this week from Jim Simbala, who's the pastor at Brooklyn Tab, Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York, of how prayer works. Because they're, they're probably the number one praying church in America. They have a Tuesday night prayer meeting that will be packed out and that people will get there early to pray, to get a seat in the house of God. In Brooklyn, in a several thousand seat auditorium. The pastor was telling the story how just a few years ago they were in a building campaign and they were starting the building uh, but they needed $6 million. And they didn't have $6 million. And if they didn't get the $6 million, they were going to lose the money that they already put up front, and they were just going to lose it. They started praying. And he went on a mission trip. And he came back, still had not heard anything. They still not got any money. He came in the office Monday morning. The mail came in. He opened up the mail. He opened up one envelope, and there was a $1 million check from a man that he'd been trying to get a meeting with. He opens up another envelope, and there's a $5 million check there from a man that he has never met before. Say, can God answer prayer? Yes, when God's people start praying. Let me give you one other example of how God can work in people's lives that are hurting. One service Sunday morning, during the invitation, there was people in the altar praying, and pastor was praying, uh, praying for somebody, and he got up after praying, and he bumped into this lady as he was getting up just after praying because there were several people in the altar, and he says, excuse me. And all of a sudden, now that lady who's very sharply dressed comes, no problem. So pastor, and he looks, and he looks for Adam's apple. And he realizes, this is the guy. And he tells his wife, Carol, then the servant says, see that lady? She's a guy. Carol's ain't no way. She is dressed to the nine to the part. And so pastor got to know this man, 
and found out their church had been doing a ministry in what's called the salt mines at that time in Brooklyn. Now it's been cleaned up. But at that time it was a big place for male prostitutes. It was an awful place of sin and degradation. And what their church had been doing is they'd been going in there and they'd just been giving them blankets and some water and praying for them and just trying to tell them that Jesus loves them. In a place that most of us wouldn't even dare to go to because we would just write those people off. But this church had been ministering to them. So this man's name was Ricardo. His street name was Sarah. And so over time they ministered to Ricardo and he finally gave his life to Christ. He surrendered his life to Christ and he says, Pastor, I feel like I'm, he says, I'm clean. And so Pastor Jim says, all right, now he tells him, all right, now it's time to get baptized, but you got to get baptized in, in man's clothing because God created you as a man. And Ricardo says, I don't even have any men's clothing. So they got him some men's clothing and they got him baptized and started pouring into them. And he starts coming to church and he's starting being faithful to church. And what's amazing is then about a year later, Ricardo comes to the pastor and says, you're not going to believe this. I've met a woman. She's a godly woman. And am I interested in her? And what happened shortly after that? You know, over time, they dated, they got married. And then God used them to go back into those areas and minister to those that they, where he'd come from. See, prayer is powerful. That church had been praying and ministering to those people, and he would say, ain't no way any of those are going to get saved. But they did and can. See, don't forget, your prayers can move the heart of God. Not because you're so great, but because if you go in, in Christ's righteousness and you go according to the will of God, you need to understand the greatest weapon at your disposal, the greatest weapon you have is prayer. And that's why we're commanded to pray for one another. Because it's a great weapon of how we can pray for God to move in somebody's life. We can pray for one another, and we can pray for those that don't know Him. That's why we need to pray for one another. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do love you. We do praise you. We thank you so much.